Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is Sustainability Live, Contra Costa, Sustainable Contra Costa's regular monthly series on sustainability and a variety of different topics. I'm Mark Westwin. Uh, I'm your host for this evening. Tonight's topic is living with wildlife in your backyard, mainly living with urban critters, okay, and how to do that properly and so we can coexist uh, in this environment together. Our guest tonight is Megan Andrews, the outreach program specialist and hospital technician with the Lindsay Wildlife Experience, formerly for those of us that have lived in the area, the uh, Lindsay Museum. Uh, as usual, we invite you to comment on uh, uh, tonight's show and ask questions through the chat. We'll, ask, uh, we'll open up the uh, audio at some point for you to ask questions. Um, and we would love to have this be participatory. So, um, Let's begin. I'm just looking here for my screen. There we go. I see everybody. Cool. So Megan, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. This is an interesting topic. And, and uh, I, I want to say that this was inspired by two things. Number one is we've heard a lot in the news recently about uh, coyotes, coyotes attacking someone in Moraga and then I guess somewhere over in the peninsula, number one. And, you know, kind of brings into mind what's going on in our um, you know, urban rural interface here that coyotes would become uh, at least uh, apparently more aggressive. And then secondly, you know, my own experience, I've got a raccoon, I've got a, my, the stray cat that I feed, uh, you know, we keep the food bowl outside and this raccoon, big raccoon comes up sometimes with its family. And, you know, I walk outside and I look at the raccoon and he doesn't scatter away. And he kind of looks at me like, well, I'm going to eat, right? You know, he'll take a step back and, you know, he just feels both friendly and like, dude, you shouldn't be eating the cat's food. So I thought, all right, you know, it's time for me to find out more about, you know, the local critters. We have possums, we have skunks in the area, we got lots of squirrels. So I went onto your website and I realized here to talk more about, you know, how we live together with the local urban wildlife. So Megan, thank you again for joining us. Tell us about yourself and your work at the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. Thanks, Mark. So like I said, um, my name is Megan um, and I am a Bay Area native, I was, uh, born in Oakland and I'm also uh, used to calling it, grew up calling it Lindsay Museum. Um, even though the name has changed in marketing, we will all still accept that name. So I mean, <laughs> Good. police yourself on that. And because we are still a museum as much as we are still a hospital and an education center uh, and a haven for non-releasable wild animals. So a little bit about me, because I think you should always vet your speakers mm -hmm. um, and so I'm qualified. So I graduated UC Davis uh, in 2017 uh, with uh, yes, in wildlife, fish and conservation biology. I've, my particular interests are in herpetology and ornithology, which is like reptiles and birds, uh, and also human wildlife conflicts. Um, I had a wonderful mentor who was one of the OG um, original people helping clear islands and uh, like how delicate island ecology is. And it's, it's fascinating. It's a whole unique uh, field of study on its own. Um, and that's where a lot of you know, work needs to be done today, as I'm sure you know, because uh, historically sort of Lindsay has always been a wonderful place to learn about animals and to help animals. But um, with our current staff, we're trying to sort of shift away from this typical like holding an owl. And this is an owl. And this is how many mice they eat in a year. And aren't I so cool that I can hold an owl? Because there's not much that you all will get from that. Or even if it's kids, like you might remember how many quills a porcupine has, but you know, what long-term effect is there really? So um, that's why we're doing more open uh, discussions like this. And we like to hear from the community because as I would say, conservation starts with the community. Um, and I, and education staff member. So typically my job would be going to schools and bringing our animal ambassadors and teaching kids. Obviously that's not really been a thing for the past year. So what I've been doing is I've recruited into the our Lindsay Hospital um, because typically we run on the help of many, many wonderful volunteers. And of course we had to send all of our volunteers home for their safety. So that meant going from a usual hospital shift of about 12 to 14 people two, four, and oh, wow. a lot of people are um, split between things. So that's the whole, that's the front desk, that's the people doing the intake exams, the surgeries, the daily husbandry, the food, the 
everything. So about two weeks into shutdown, um, they put out the call um, and I volunteered. So I, uh, no one in my household is of an at-risk group. So I got a crash course in everything hospital from about March to October. Wow. So I am now very uniquely able to talk about um, all the things we've seen. Well, anything you can see in one year, but everything from hummingbirds to, you know, coyotes to the non-natives that get dropped on our doorstep. Um, I've dealt with a lot of members of the public, both the ones that really want to help and the ones that don't. Um, and I, I am really, this is something I'm really passionate about. And I'm really glad that I can now um, add more personal experience to what I've heard. So I'm not just parroting back what I've heard from the hospital, um, but now we can have sort of unique nuanced discussions because um, as I was explaining to Mark earlier that most everyone in our community or in particularly the Bay Area uh, likes wildlife and they want to help. Like most people, like the normal setting is, you know, you argue like it. So there's no need for us to go around and being like, you should be nice to animals. It's, we know you like animals and here is how you can help us because a lot of our sort of, what's the nice term of the headaches that we might get in the hospital are problems that were from people trying to help. And we know that they didn't mean to and that it's frustrating. There's, you can find a lot of misinformation um, when you're trying to help. So um, that's why I'm here. You have my time tonight to ask me if you've ever had any burning questions on if there's anything you can do to help in your own immediate area. And I am happy to help answer to the best of my abilities. Great. Well, thank you. You know, um, before we get into the coyote question, you know, which I kind of led off with, you mentioned that you get animals coming to the museum um, based on uh, because of the problems that humans create. Now, are you talking about you know, incidents with cars or tell us tell us what you mean by that? I'm just about everything. So um, most of the programs I give are, you know, to children. And mm -hmm. I typically open with why, you know, what's a reason you think a wild animal would have to come to the hospital? And right. almost always the reasons we get are like, maybe, you know, they hurt themselves on a rock or a bigger animal hurt them or, mm -hmm. you know, they tripped or something. And I can usually, I usually spin that to like, okay, sure. Like maybe they tripped and hurt themselves on plastic or that bigger animal that hurt them might have been a cat like your house cat um, or any other number of things. And those are, you know, the more you think about and look at the problems that um, the source is all, almost always um, people. Like occasionally we get wildlife, wildlife um, interactions, but it's pretty rare. So, you know, cat caught is a huge one. I could talk for like an hour on why you should not let domestic cats outside. Um, people, nuisance animals, people, don't realize it's a, it's actually illegal to trap animals in your own yard and relocate them. Uh, there's a lot of delicate things you can mess up doing that, um, or even just like uh, tree trimming. Like by accident, you get a bunch of baby birds and you don't know what to do with them. Hmm. Um, yeah, if you accidentally leave out you know food or poison for something and you get an animal sick, um, our other or our other top ones, uh, window strikes, um, birds hitting right. windows are a huge one. Um, the weather events, uh, knocking things down, particularly when we have lots of non-native trees that are not um, built to sustain like the weather here. So, you know, we're, that's part of our, you know, our mission is to help kind of clean up and bring awareness to the mess that we're creating, you know, by living in the space. Because even if you're smack in the middle of San Francisco, like there is wildlife all around you. There are coyotes, there are raccoons, there's everything. Um, and you might think it's human turf, but you're just not seeing them. And so, so do you ever run across situations? I know it's a big deal with the uh, seals and so forth that people say, Oh, here's this cute little baby fill in the blank. It must be abandoned. I'll bring it in. And yet it's not abandoned. And all of a sudden it's been separated from its mother. Does that happen frequently? Does you get that as a, how can you tell actually? A you lot. Know? Um, okay. Well, it, it depends on the animal. So, uh, for that specific situation, usually, you know, that's typically what like the cuter ones. So um, right. uh, fawns and baby deer, that's a big one. Um, mm -hmm. Any of you are wildlife fans, you might know that uh, what you to do if you find a baby fawn down on its own is to leave it alone because that's the moms leave them while they go and do mommy deer things. Um, right. And that was actually one, one of the, if not, I think the first release I did was, um, uh, 
tracking down the mother so I could reunite uh, the baby because the baby was so young, it still had its umbilicus attached. Oh, wow. And if, you know, you don't find the mom within a day or two, the window's gone and now you have a baby to hand raise and right, uh, right. doesn't really have the facilities to take care of um, larger things like deer and coyotes. And the, and the mother would, would accept the fawn back. Uh, yes, I actually have all the footage from that one. Oh, that's great. Um, before I get into that one, I, mm -hmm. I can definitely elaborate. Um, I can go ahead and share that first video I mentioned. Yeah, please. So I was sort of inspired to make this because, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people think that um, vet veterinary work in general, but also like working with wild animals that like it looks really fun and, you know, fulfilling and you get to hold and take care of all these cute baby animals. And some of that is true. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot else and, you know, animals don't like going to the doctor. They don't like to see you at all. So, well, and while you're queuing that up, I didn't realize that the museum had, uh, did surgery. I know that you nursed animals back to health, but a full fledged animal surgery. That's interesting. I mean, that's oh, yeah. high end stuff. A, wow. Our trailer is a uh, specially equipped to be sterile, um, Wow. And our, our wonderful, God, amazing lead nice. vet, uh, Dr. Wu, um, takes on. Not It's fairly uncommon, but like um, last summer we had a, a western pond turtle with a swallowed fish hook. Oh. Um, and during that surgery, they found out she was gravid, which is turtle for pregnant. Wow. So, I'm sure yeah. that. so uh, what we're going to do, I'll go ahead. This is just, just a minute long. Okay. Share this one. Um, yeah. And it's coming up. Um, there it is. Okay. Uh, it? Coming right. up. Uh, right there. Go. Okay. Yep. Let me crank up the volume a bit. <laughs> of the clips of animals biting me that I have, um, which is it's what's, it's what's going to happen. That's just why you have the right gear for that. <laughs> I think I remember, my favorite thing is all the specific I, gear we have for seagulls. It's hmm. weird. We have, we have specific goggles and gloves just for seagulls, which we do not get very often, but I like breaking them out. <laughs> and that's because they have uh, their beaks. They'll bite you. Uh, yes, they like to go. <laughs> so with like hawks, you just have to, uh, or raptors, you know, birds of prey with the talons, you secure the body and the feet. Um, but with uh, a lot of water birds, you secure the body and the head because they will go for your eyes. Water birds don't mess around. <laughs> well, and I, I remember back in, I don't know, the 80s or something like that, there was a big oil spill off of uh, Muir Beach. And so we all went out and helped wash the cormorants and stuff. And they made it really clear that don't mess with cormorants because they can put their beak through your hand really quickly. So the whole protocol in handling them. Interesting. Well, yeah, so we tell, us some more, <laughs> tell us some more stories. Tell us, talk about the, the, the coyote controversy these days. Cause you know, it, it's shown up on the news a couple of times and might as well get that, you know, addressed. Uh, sure, we can go over that first. Um, so first of all, I, I'm one, not a mammal expert, and I am also not a large mammal expert, which is oh. also a whole other thing. So uh, I do know more than, you know, I just as a wildlife biologist, oh. but um, if we get more 
depending on how nuanced we get, I may just refer you to our website because sure, I, don't, sure. I don't want to spread misinformation. Well, I guess what I'm looking at is what, what's bringing coyotes a little closer? Are they losing their fear of us as hikers or, you know, coming more into backyards for lack of food because of the drought? Um, because they're not seeing us out because of the pandemic, you know, we're, we're stuck at home and they're feeling more comfortable coming in, you know, any sense of the change that we're seeing, or are we just hearing it in the news because we're, it's part of the news cycle, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, it's a little call, may a little call and be. So, you know, first of all, I'm sure we've all seen you know, pictures of like the wildlife that have kind of, um, reclaimed the areas, you know, that people are going in, but of course, you know, most people are back to their usual stuff. Um, but this specific situation with the coyote in the La Mirinda area, um, I want to stress that this is an anomaly. So Good. there's a reason that, you know, this kind of thing makes the news cycle because uh, coyotes are all around us. You know, they're here, they're in our areas. Um, I don't know if you're on next door. Um, I'm on in a couple my parents' neighborhood in my own kind of for me monitoring wildlife stuff, but people are always shocked to see a coyote in the hills near their house at hmm. dusk or dawn. And that is where they are. That's where they've been for thousands of years and they will continue to be here. In fact, I just uh, learned today from my supervisor that in areas where they've culled or um, you know, euthanized a certain percentage of coyotes to reduce the population, uh, they just have more babies more often to make up for it. There's, a, there's an equilibrium. So I have a feeling that we're going to be seeing a lot of, you know, uh, affronted mothers and fam, you know, in the news saying, asking why us wildlife people just aren't just doing anything about it. But, you know, like I said, the answer is this is an anomaly. There's a reason you don't constantly hear about this because it is unusual for not just a coyote to be, you know, familiar with human presence, but the fact that this one is actively going up to people and um, being behaving aggressively. That is unusual. Okay. Um, and they don't, uh, Fish and Wildlife does not believe it's rabid. Um, Good. So that's not a concern. Um, also, it's nice. I personally, I have rabies vaccination to work with animals. Um, I think everyone should, if you have the opportunity, um, because we do have a number of vector species and it's not a disease to be messed with, but that's not um, the case here. Like I said, it's, um, you know, this is sort of an anomaly, but from what um, we can give our best guess is that it's likely that um, you know, like a lot of us, a lot of us, like I said, we're wildlife lovers. Um, and it's certainly possible someone was feeding it. Right. So they might have been seeing it coming around their yard uh, and getting friendly. And of course, people want to help and be nice and you know put out food. Um, and uh, like Florida has a big problem with um, doing like alligator tours. So like you know you pay a certain amount and someone takes you out to go throw a bunch of hot dogs at, you know, an alligator. And, you know, they sure seem happy and they <laughs> like it. But, you know, what happens when, you know, you and your boat leave and that kind of thing is that the next person who wanders up to that animal is gonna have a large, wow. potentially dangerous predator coming up to you and expecting food. And if you don't give them food, right, putt putt. Right, right. Um, they can get really, they don't understand why you're not giving them food. Like they're like, I'm here, I'm right. getting it. Why am I not? Interesting. And that's where you have problems. And you know, when this animal is apprehended by animal control, it's it's going to be you know destroyed. Um, and it's not so, the fault. So so I I've literally seen coyotes walking through downtown Mill Valley, and they you know people basically ignore them. They just kind of wander through the downtown square. But at what point? should you call animal control with respect to any of the critters that we have or, or we'll talk about tonight? Um, that's a good question because uh, uh, they animal control and Lindsay too, um, you know, they receive lots of calls that, you know, are of normal situations of people that are concerned. Uh, and if you do have concerns, you know, you can err on the side of calling anyway. Um, so things to look at are, you know, uh, you know, you can do your own research into their behavior, like just because, you know, that animal, like uh, bobcats, for example, just because you see it out during the day does not necessarily mean that anything's, you know, typically wrong with it. Um, they, they do come out occasionally during the day. It's not super common. Um, and a lot of these times that you're, it's sort of just unique that you're seeing it. So if you do see anything erratic um, or unusual, like uh, behaving strangely, it may, um, 
have a condition that's causing it to be out in the open. If it's particularly not afraid of people, that's a big, you know, concern. You know, even if it's, um, you know, like a deer, like if it's a deer just walking up to people and getting in the road, like that's also going to cause issues in a lot of areas. Um, if you have, um, you know, and if you have neighbors that are encouraging, you know, wildlife in unsafe ways, you can also call um, to do that. If you have, you know, there's, you, on our website, we have um, tons of resources because we love when people are interested. Um, and if you know what's in your area, um, how to be a good citizen. It's hard to, you know, kind of give a general thing on that. Um, right. But like you said, like you mentioned, like, opossums or raccoons or stuff there's um specific things i can recommend for all of those yeah so so what i'm looking at is that i guess as as humans living in a formerly wild environment are we looking at cleansing our environment of these critters that naturally live in you know uh, central california the, the raccoons the possums the skunks and so forth by oh my god i saw one i better call up animal control because there's a raccoon you know or or is it more appropriate to think about you know living peacefully together do they have a place are there are there benefits that we gain particularly in a sur suburban environment with having a possum or a skunk or a raccoon in our midst no oh, ab absolutely um a bigger thing is uh, so part of like island ecology like i mentioned is i'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of introducing an animal to an area to try to fix a problem which creates a problem 10 times bigger, and then we deal with that for the next couple hundred years. Um, and that can happen on a small scale too. So like in your own yard. Um, uh, so anything that, you know, if you think about if their primary diet is mice, say, you know, a snake or a pair of owls, um, if you get rid of them, what's going to, you know, happen to their prey population? You know, it's, you're just going to have other different problems or was um a uh, bats are another big one so like people call and they say they have a bat living you know in their yard and how to get rid of it and around here um bats are insectivores and eat bugs and they're they're the ones eating the mosquitoes in your yard oh, okay. so i would rather have a bat or two than <laughs> many many insects i'm not huge on uh, bug guys. mosquitoes yeah we see them all the time bats in, in the summertime so where do these critters live in a suburban environment? Are they truly creatures of our, you know, storm drains? Um, or are they hiding out in fringe areas, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's tons of places, you know, to hide in the city or in the areas. And we've, um, even in areas that are completely developed, there's still mm -hmm. lots of vegetation um, there's, mm -hmm. there's more trees on earth than there have ever been. Mm -hmm. We're planting so many for our own um, purposes, but also, you know, there's no, uh, you, I, I can't just generalize when it's all wildlife. Um, so, you know, things like coyotes and um, raccoons are what we call um, like a generalist and they adapt and they are doing really, really well <laughs> in um, what we call anthropogenic or human-based areas. Uh, for, so raccoons are a North American animal, but they were introduced to Japan after a movie, I believe in the late 90s, um, introduced, you know, everyone wanted raccoons as a pet, shipped raccoons over, oh, it's a boy. horrible idea, there are raccoons living all over Japan now. Oh, in wow. A lot of cities. But there are also animals that do not do very well. So if you compare like the morning dove to the passenger pigeon, Two mm -hmm. very similar. They're even, you know, down to the same family of birds, and their, um, you know, populations. Of course, 100, 200 years ago were, you know, much different than they are now. But morning doves exploded and are doing really well. And mm -hmm. passenger pigeons need, um, they need a big group of um, mutual species to be able to keep going, and you know, they just were not able to thrive. So if you know, people are intent on what they think is clearing out wildlife. They're just going to clear out the ones that are not, uh, the ones that are specialists. So what you're going to end up with is a lot of the trash animals. So pigeons, raccoons, all of the other things, because <laughs> they're not going anywhere. You're gonna be here. It doesn't matter how many campaigns you put out, because right. also, the ones that are sent, you know, to manage these wildlife are, you know, we're wildlife lovers. Like, 
people, that's the one kind of interesting thing is when people come up to us at the hospital or, and I imagine, I've never worked for animal control, but I imagine this happens too. They call up and they kind of ask in like a, why don't you care? Or like, you know, why are you so mean to all these animals? So it's, we kind of spent our whole lives getting to this point, you know, huh. none of us are going to be rich. It's not like a glamorous thing. Um, this is probably the biggest audience I've had in about 18 months. Um, you know, we do like what we do, but it's not always going to make sense necessarily from the outside. Right. So um, but it's you're just trained. important to be, you know, be nice to, uh, I mean, everyone, people in general, but, you know, especially people on the front lines uh, that are working their butts off to help animals. There's probably a chance that they do care and they might just not be smiling at you because it's <laughs> been a long uh, life. Well, and speaking of birds, and thank you for that, you know, let's hear it for the animal control folks. Um, right on. Um, speaking of birds, I know that a while back there was controversy around the uh, endangered peregrine falcon. And I know that uh, there were discussions about protecting areas, you know, the open R8 open space over in Walnut Creek and so forth. And yet there was a peregrine falcon nest on Ignatia Valley Boulevard. You know, they're saying stay away, stay away. You know, what's the current state of affairs with peregrine falcons? Are they currently still endangered or they, I, we see them around. So any news on them? Uh, yeah, um, actually our ambassador, uh, Peregrine Falcon Flash is one of my favorites. He's just a sensitive, wonderful soul. Um, so yeah, uh, they're, Peregrine Falcons are, you know, another conservation success story. They were um, not doing well for a long time, you know, partially due to a lot of pesticides and you know, clearing out things. But fortunately, um, sorry, I can't be get, I don't know any solid stats off the top of my head on that one, but um, you know, like they said, they thrive in cities and around people. Um, and now that we've, you know, sort of corrected our wrongs and that population is coming back, you can pretty much find peregrine falcons anywhere you can find pigeons, um, <laughs> which is going to be all over um, the world. Mm -hmm. like pigeons and falcons are just like a, a neck and neck in evolution. Like they're both incredibly fast um, and also do incredibly well in um, city areas, which and also living, you know, in developed areas lends itself to a lot of you know, health problems, um, any number of things from electrocution to entanglement um, to, you know, uh, companies that go out and, you know, intentionally destroy all the nests because people don't want um, the animals around around there. So um, s s speaking of, speaking of disease, um, we've got a couple questions in in the chat about, uh, I, I believe it's salmonella that has. Uh, appeared in bird feeders. So what's the scoop on salmonella and contaminated bird feeders? Uh, yeah, so um, this, the current salmonella outbreak that we're seeing a lot in the pine siskins and the finches right now, this sort of occurred right after I vacated the hospital and started going back to education. So um, I'll tell you what I know on that, um, which is right now the recommendation is to um, empty out all bird bass and uh, feeders and bring them inside because it's just not healthy to be encouraging a congregation of them at this moment. Wow. So I think of it as social distancing and also um, I know I'm not always studious about cleaning my bird feeders but um, that's always been a thing you know not just salmonella but um, oh my gosh I'm blanking on myco um, other lots of other diseases can be spread because you know all the birds are coming and they're getting in one area um and i believe it's all up the west coast up to washington to um encouraging to bring them in and we know that that's gonna not a lot of people are you know going to be resistant to that um and not understand why um you feel like they're helping but you know at a certain point you know you need to decide like what is you know, what are you doing for yourself um and knowing that um, what you, you're, what you can really do to help them is to bring things inside. You might not see the birds for a while, um, but what you're going to be doing is encouraging a healthier population. So and so, is that is that like an epidemic that would crest and eventually go away, and people can look forward to bringing their bird baths back, or or bird feeders back, um, or is this something that's now more endemic in our area? 
Um, I mean, of course, you know, eventually I, I am not a, you know, virologist, um, medical, right. um, that is not my background, but of, I certainly imagine, you know, within the next. Okay. The recommendation that I saw was uh, after April 1st, because they felt that the pine siskins who were the primary problem would be leaving the area by then. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Also, so this is going to, we're heading into you know, our migratory area um, of the year. So you see a lot of really cool birds, you know, around this kind of transitory time. And, you know, if they catch it yeah, or a few deer, they're going to be bringing it up and down. Um, like right in my yard, I can see lots of thrushes and um, warblers and other cool migratory stuff. And um, that's another, you know, clean your own the stuff you're putting in your yard and also you know don't relocate any animals because they can spread things between themselves just like we can um, and it's important to listen to the top experts on you know how to protect them because there's enough going on right now making lives difficult okay so so the priority number one is move your bird feeders indoors and if you're resistant clean them right right well i would still say you know just bring them in, in general just because okay they're, the congregating of birds right now um, is still what's causing it. So not just the feeders itself. Ah, uh, it's the okay. It's the, and, um, I think the interaction. Kind of, so yeah, okay. it's also it's hummingbird feeders. It's general ones. It's bird baths. Um, they're just trying okay. to until this uh, starts going back down. You know, it, it's like when when the virus arose in in America, and now with the birds. You know, if we had promoted the virus as cooties nobody would be near each other right everybody would be wearing a mask because everybody knows how contagious cooties are but you know it same thing what you're saying is birds transmitted among themselves and we should really help out those populations by helping them be socially distant okay sure because i mean they're they're going to find their resources in the wild right not we feed right. them but when they're um, when you pull the bird feeders back and they're foraging on their own, they're going to be, you know, on their own. They're not going to be in a big group. Right. Going around together. That's a good point. Um, and that's what's best for them right now. Okay, cool. So what's, uh, I know you've got a background in herpetology. Um, what's going on in the world of herpetology these days? I know, I know Contra Costa has like rattlesnakes. I think there's, you know, there's rattlesnakes is the, prevalent dangerous snake. I got once in a while a coral snake and that's pretty much it for dangerous snakes and coral snakes are very, very rare. Um, mm -hmm. I know that, I don't know, again, 20 years ago, we had a bloom of rattlesnakes like out in the Pinole area and stuff. I think the development boom out there was driving them out. What's your favorite uh, uh, snake or, uh, you know, tell us some stories. Oh, this is my time to shine. Um, there you go. I'm actually a big fan of rattlesnakes. I have a jangly um, <laughs> here. So much, yeah. much to my mother's dismay, um, I've always just been fascinated by snakes um, and venomous ones too. And in, in California, we're actually pretty, well, fortunate for, I guess, the average person that we only have um, really one, um, one general type of um, venomous snake, which is the rattlesnake. So they, it comes in different forms. You have the sidewinder in the desert, you have your um, northern, southern, western Pacifics, um, all these other specific ones. But um, yeah, way down in like the very corner of California desert, you might be finding some other things, but uh, generally you just, you know, if you can identify a rattlesnake, um, you're good. You don't need to worry about, you know, being anxious if the thing you're seeing is venomous in that case. Of course, if you're a child, I would say stay away from them in general. But um, you know, if it's hissing and shaking at you, you know, give it, give it its distance. And also, rattlesnakes are, you know, if it's the only one we have, it, it gives you a warning, a loud warning, you know, because it wants to be left alone. Um, and I promise that a snake will never chase you down. Um, I own, I've worked with tons of snakes, um, and they, they just want to sit and chill. And unless you smell like a mouse at the perfect temperature, um, they're not going to be going out of their way to be going after you. Good to know. Common, common statistic, it's like most, um, the vast majority of rattlesnake envenomations are, you know, males of a certain age that are, <laughs> that, that whose words be shortly before were watch this. Um, right. <laughs> I, I, nearly, I, am, I am nearly in that demographic. Um, but you know they, they really get a bad rap um, and 
I, I've lived in California here and and in the in this general area for all of my life, and I have seen three rattlesnakes total. Oh yeah, even if I've you hiked, go out looking for them, I go out looking for them, and they're impossible to find. And yeah, so it's not like for for those of you that are new to you know Contra Costa or haven't lived here for a long time, you know. I, I just don't consider that to be a hazard. I'm, I'm conscious, you know, when I'm walking down a trail, uh, particularly what uh, I think time of day, you're going to want to watch uh, a little bit later in dusk, right? They come out in the cooler part of summertime. Uh, yeah. So they like when, um, when the surfaces are warm. So snakes like um, we call like a source of belly heat. So instead of like, you wouldn't put like a lamp over them necessarily if you have them in a husbandry setting, you want to put something underneath because that's where most of the surface area of their body is. Mm -hmm. So in the evening when the sun's going down, that's when all the roads are really warm. Mm -hmm. that's why a lot of people see them when they go out jogging around that time. Um, and even if they're, you know, they might be crossing a, a walkway, somewhere, but uh, typically you don't need to worry about seeing them in grass. It's going to be rocks um, and pavement and those sorts of crevices. I have, if I can share my screen again, I'm going to try to mm -hmm. share the sure. window so i don't um yeah so i always get very excited when i see <laughs> we have a rattlesnake coming in can you see my screen mm -hmm. yes okay. so it's another one we work with animal control a lot i have a video of them bringing them to us because when you yeah, think, um you, you know when rattlesnake is injured or stuck or needs our help we are the ones that get to fix them. So um, as much as I enjoy it, you know, it is still potentially dangerous. So here's a large rattlesnake stuck in plastic netting. Yeah, you might want to comment on that too, by the way. I noticed on your website a, a note about the plastic webbing, garden webbing. I actually love it. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's a big, um, all kinds of animals. Shoot, I have a bunch of it. Um, it's on my other upstairs. Uh, yeah, that plastic garden netting you put under lawns and in th all kinds of landscaping. Um, it's just terrible for animals. Um, you know, and people, when they're done with it, they just kind of leave it in piles in their yard. And just because it's your own property and it's not, you know, technically littering, it's still um, going to cause a lot of problems. Uh, so uh, what you do with this, if you've ever wondered how you get a rattlesnake out of um, something like that, as uh, I have a, you know, um, yeah, how do you get, you know, a rattlesnake to sit down for their exam uh, <laughs> is you don't. Um, you get, That's a good one. Hang on. Where is my, this is not the folder I want. Um, pardon me. Uh, yeah, you basically have that squeeze cage. That's what they're putting it in so that uh, they can put down a protective layer and then through the grating, uh, then they can go through a surgical tools um, and help uh, cut wow. into that. So that was one of the highlights of my year was just getting to help hold that cage while we help free the snake. I wow. lived for that moment. Um, <laughs> and then after, after you get them free, they're just as angry as when you started. <laughs> um, and then you get to, you know, monitor them for a while until they're ready to go back out. So what about, what about other um, uh, snakes in this area? You know, um, I've seen king snakes out here, and, but, but they're very rare, I would imagine, right? Is, is that, are um, they, I mean, or are they more shy? You know? Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as like what they're considered, um, they're, you know, of least concern, one of the more Mm -hmm. common what snakes you'll see but um they're generally hard to find gopher snakes i would say are a little more common um they're also a lot more chill i can just go on mm -hmm. gopher snakes generally don't care but those are the ones that look a lot like rattlesnakes and they will even try to trick you into thinking they're a rattlesnake by puffing up their head into a triangle and shaking their tail even though they don't have a rattle because a lot of people will still fall for it because right. you know they don't they don't want to take any risk with that uh, which is which is wise, right? I mean, in other words, don't pick up something that even looks like a rattlesnake, right? Unless yeah. unless you're absolutely certain. It's particular for young people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, even in general, even if it's not a dangerous snake, like it's still mm -hmm. best. I just leave them where they are, unless you're trying, you know, 
a scientist doing a survey. Um, mm -hmm. I think the most common one you'll probably find is the uh, ring neck snake or um, a sharp pale snake. They're both they're really small. They're only like the size of a pencil. Uh, ring necks have that bright, sorry, the ring neck are colored. Um, or they have that bright orange underside. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people, you know, I get, I get a lot of inquiries, you know, through my parents and other acquaintances asking, you know, animal ID questions. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's trying to convince you that it's a dangerous animal by that bright orange underside, but it's not. Um, so they're yeah, good to have around. They'll eat the slugs in your yard. And there's red racers and there's the garter snakes, right? Gar yeah, so. garters, they, <laughs> garters will not bite you, but they're very fast and they do stink a lot. <laughs> right, right, right. So earlier on, you mentioned um, you know non-native animals that that people bring to the museum. What do you see? I mean, people have exotic pets, and um, yeah. I mean, literally, we found a chuckwalla, big lizard, big desert lizard, walking down the street in our neighborhood when I was uh, in college visiting my folks over in uh, over by Foothill and Media, and I think, how did this chuckwalla? like almost like a Gila monster walking down the street. So I would imagine it's an ex escape pet or, you know, are you seeing exotic pets get out or come in for care or something like that? Yeah, that would be fascinating. I've never heard of them. Yeah, Chuck Wall, I would, I would definitely say that's a released pet because um, they're, they're native to the desert. There's just, there's no chance yeah. of being this, this far north. And it's also not, um, I <laughs> I don't believe it's legal to keep them as pets because they are native protected species um, at this point. We do, we have a pair of Chuck Wallace at the zoo, oh, okay. um, part of our collection, uh, Chucky and Guapo. Uh, mm -hmm. They come to new schools all the time. Uh, but yeah, that's a big part of um, our um, you know, mission is people come to us with animals, you know, both, um, you know, I'm going to make a whole video that's talking about like domestic versus feral versus habituated versus all kinds hmm. of things. Cause like, um, you know, there's animals like this, which are, you know, a sort of pigeons are, uh, have been domesticated over, you know, many thousands of years. Um, and they're actually not technically native to this area. So, really? uh, wow. does not rehab and release pigeons, um, around there are non-native. We have our, a native, um, bantail pigeon, which looks kind of like this guy, except for they have like yellow, uh, beak and feet. Uh, and they're they're fairly uncommon. I've never seen them in the wild. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, aren't those pretty rare? Oh <clears throat> uh, yeah, they're they're bigger. You can usually tell them apart. Um, we shoot. What have I gotten this year? Uh, lots of turtles. Um, mm -hmm. We only have one native freshwater turtle in California, the western pond turtle. So if you see one, uh, like a lot at Heather Farm, mm -hmm. around in the Canal Trail, you'll see a lot of red ear sliders which are also, they're turtles native to the U.S., but the Eastern U.S., um, they are the ones you can get from Petco or Chinatown for, you know, dirt cheap. Uh, and they also get huge. And I like turtles in general. I cannot, I do not recommend them as pets at all. It's a lot of work and they hmm. stink and they last forever. And it's, you know, and people, <laughs> people bring us a lot of, you know, ready sliders. And unfortunately, we, you know, we can't, Take, we don't have the resources to take them in. We have released them, but we can um, direct you to a rescue that does. There's a few in the area. We have a whole phone book directory of rescues that we direct people to and work with. Um, I got okay. a big fluffy pet rabbit last summer. That was obviously not a wild rabbit, but you know, it's not obvious to everyone. And I mentioned, you know, said to take it to um, animal control, Contra Costa shelter. Um, but he said that if we didn't take it, he would go out and let it go in a field. Um, oh. So I got to foster it and then drive it over. So, you know, okay. please don't make us do that because oh. we, we will. And it's, it hurts. Well, so, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is that in effect, I'm putting in my mind an ecosystem together. You've got animal control for dangerous situations and animals that are out of control. And then you've got veterinaries who deal with, you know, pets and animals and so forth. And then you've got the, the Lindsay Museum that, that does care. But in your case, when people bring animals to you, it's a one-way it's a one way trip. Yeah, you're not it. giving it back, right? I mean, yeah. and you're not, you're not in the, you're not, and then there's shelters and the rescue uh, organization. So people aren't, 
it's not appropriate to dump their pets on the museum. It's that's not the path, right? Regardless of what no. kind of animal it is. Yeah. I mean, if you're if you're not sure, or even if like you know it's not, and you just you know you want help, like I well, I can't speak for literally everyone, but I'm certainly more than happy to help people find out where they need to go. Okay. Because uh, you know, typically you know there's still a chance for a happy ending and I'm not just going to be like, that's not native and close the right. door in your face. Cause obviously we care, even if it's not native. Um, cause, and it happens on a pre like almost every day, something, hmm. you know, if it's okay. a Eurasian, um, we get a lot of Asian house sparrows wow. um, or what are our other, um, or, and some are more of like a nuanced area. So like opossums are technically not native, but uh, they're great for the ecosystem. Um, detrimental effects on there so we do take in opossums but you know you can always just call and ask or have that's not nice okay so the answer is call call first before you release them out at the local park regardless of what it is right yeah. please yes. I, I don't know if there's anything <laughs> should go to park um and on that subject of relocation um because mm -hmm. when people will come to us and they'll have like an adult raccoon in a cage mm -hmm. and they're like okay what's what's wrong and the answer is we don't want it in our yard don't say that for sure, but um, you know they're they're going to be in your yard. And the the sort of the short answer is, you take it out, another one is just going to move right back in. You know, unless you actually you know fence off your the un, the crawl under your house or anything like you're not um, doing much. And in fact, one person did that for us. They described it. They relocated you know a raccoon somewhere. Um, but the way it sounded, that that raccoon was um, a nursing mother, so oh. it oh. actually had babies somewhere in that original location, and also Jeez. it probably had um, a disease. So right, right. Now the disease is spread, and also there's sort of an unknown. Hey, okay, <laughs> sit down. Sorry, I have freckles that he thinks are seeds, and we're still <laughs> uh, learning things like objects. And now hey, uh, Megan, we. Uh... We did get a question in the chat about foxes, and I believe the, that the red fox is technically not a native, right? And the gray foxes are the, are the local ones. Um, right. But is there a, a, anything folks should do to discourage foxes if you have uh, any animals? That, I mean, are, are they a danger to pets? I, I have chickens, so I know I have to protect no, the coop um, from them. But, you know, cats and dogs aren't really fox prey are they no um but the gray foxes we have around here they're extremely shy and reclusive um they are able to climb fences <coughs> and trees, so they're they're able to get near yard um i personally i had a tiny you know 10 pound dog um living in the walnut creek area and um i watched my parents accidentally let him out to what they thought was a cat in the yard and he ran right up to it it was a fox and he gets up close he goes whoa and like kind of backs up fox doesn't do it's it didn't attack my dog um because again you know they don't go for things like that um also one point I, um supervisor wanted me to stress was um if you are concerned about um uh, wildlife coming in your yard and you want to do something about it first step is are you feeding you know not just birds like are you feeding your right. cats on your right. back porch putting food so, out yeah, yeah. Th there's no i don't think there's any wild this is a dangerous generalization but like you don't need to keep wildlife in general out of your yard um Good. You know, they're, they're going to be there anyway it's not you it's better to you know kind of live in harmony well i do have that, a deer fence i will say that yeah <laughs> and that's, deer, that's to protect my plants not anything else yeah. so also yeah keep the, the food out because if you're feeding um um i see where i says if you're feeding something, you are feeding up the food chain as well. So right. whatever, uh, if you're feeding something in your yard, you know, that you think it's squirrels or something, that means, you know, you're also going to be bringing in the foxes and the things that are bigger. Um, and if you're wondering why that, you know, because now there's abundant food there for them too. That's interesting because uh, uh, one of the things I learned as a, as a guide up on the, uh, up in the Sierras on the river that uh, there's this concept of micro litter that, you know, when all the rafting groups come down and we stop at the same beach and everybody has lunch, right? They tell you, don't leave e the crumbs, the little bits of chips and stuff, because 
that attracts mice and what eat mice rattlesnakes and so you know if you want to keep the beaches safe you know um don't feed the mice and uh very very interesting lesson we have a question here about uh what if somebody that you know uh, has an illegal animal and who's the right vector to call i mean uh, that sounds like an animal control call not necessarily a museum call but um you know, somebody's got a bobcat or, or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what's illegal, but I'm sure you mean bobcats that are that they're trying to keep as a pet. You know, yeah, or... exactly. And uh, you know, what's the right way to turn them in? You know, somebody's got a mountain lion <laughs> in their backyard. More, you know. Yeah, more. It's more common than you think. Um, even just really? about every animal that you you're like that would. I can't think of a more horrible pet. I guarantee you, someone around here has tried to keep it. Um, it's not. It's not nearly as big an issue as we would like to talk about. Like. Um, you know, habitat loss or um, you know, human life conflicts in general. Um, so it is still a thing, you know, to talk about, but um, there's not, you know, it's more of a, a rare thing on occasion. But, you know, when it does happen, it, it is, you know, sad because, you know, it's usually done out of, you know, a love of wildlife that's, mm -hmm. you know, misplaced. I you know we had at least a dozen, you know, cases. It's usually like squirrels. People really like to keep squirrels. Mm. Don't keep squirrels in your house. Um, Squirrels and raccoons, they're going to be really Thanks. cute until they get bigger than your palm, and then they're going to try to rip your face off. Like, mm. it, I don't care how much they've been nursing, and they're really cute. Even this, this pigeon that I raised is now, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw him biting me, I hand tube fed him like all night, all summer. And like, this is just how they, they're, you know, they're not, you know, they're, they're not going to be like dogs and cats. It's not like, that's one thing that kind of bothers me about Disney that like kind of teaches like, if you raise this bear cub like a dog, it's going to act like a dog. And it's, there's so, so many cases, you know, people getting, you know, their faces ripped off and things like that. Well, that's that. like but the, uh, that doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah, the, the uh, lion uh, people in Las Vegas, what, uh, Siegfried and Roy? Oh, yeah. And yeah, after yeah. all those years, one of them turned around and said, you know, I'm hungry or I'm pissed off, you know, so. Um, yeah, it's so, all about the scientific looking, like, do you, you know, and like we had our, um, I don't know if you remember, Lindsay had a, a cougar as an ambassador, oh. a, a mountain lion um, when, when I was a kid, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a long time ago. But the reason Lindsay had that cougar is because someone, you know, tried to raise it when it was a kitten. And then when it got bigger, it got its uh, teeth and claws removed. Oh, wow. Um, so they could try to continue keeping it, which is obviously horrible. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's certain, there's so many points where, you know, you would hope a person would step back and realize that they're they're doing this for themselves. They're not doing right. it for the animal, but you know, it's a it's a psychology thing that education hopefully tries to prevent. Yeah, I saw I was up at the Sacramento Wildlife Center and there was an evening where they brought out a juvenile mountain lion and the purr alone was intimidating. You uh -huh. know, it was a juvenile. I was like it, it, it was very impressive, but and it was properly raised and everything else. Um, so let's open this up. We're kind of coming up on eight o'clock. Let's open this up to the audience and ask if you guys have any questions or Megan, if you've got one more. Sorry about um, the sure. recent, if you'd like to see um, a bit from the fawn. Uh, yeah, please. There you go. Good. And then we can dive right back into that. Sure. Folder up of that. Um, and as much as I would love to, because um, I just think Lindsay and our team, people do um, like incredible, amazing things every day. And that's part of me in the hospital is I'm just always breaking up my phone. I'm like, why are, this is so cool. How are you so used to doing this every day? So that's why I have a completely filled, you know, drop box in the <laughs> I've done this year. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share that. Um, so, this is and and somebody asked how did you find the mother this was the fawn that was uh dropped off how did you track the mother down oh uh, yeah so the person um and this was not a, a cut and dry case of someone what we call kidnapping the baby um mm. it was sort of in like a drainage ditch so they genuinely were concerned um fortunately the deer was fine so i got to go ahead and take it back um and since i live in oakland this was in the oakland hills um, I was one that immediately drove it over and got there. So yeah, how do you find the mom? So this was a, this is a huge hillside, you know, 
Um, and I am not the most avid hiker. So, you know, what do you do? So um, I was on the phone with um, one of our expert volunteers who does this on a regular basis. And she sent me uh, an MP3 file, an audio file um, of a baby deer cry. Oh, wow. So if you've never um, heard that, I don't have it. It's essentially just like a baby goat, like meh, just over and over again. And I'm playing, I'm here with my partner. He's watching me play these baby goat sounds <laughs> to the sky. Um, you know, we just, we look like a couple of oddballs out there. And uh, lo and behold, um, you know, eventually we did find her. Wow. Um, there's just a deer kind of hanging out in that area, looking a little forlorn. Um, and of course, you know, immediately we're, you know, we don't want to scare off. You can't just run up to her and be like, here's your baby. And then right, right, stuck right. with the baby. So um, what we've done is, so we go down to the spot, um, make sure they're oriented in the right direction. So they don't, you know, head off in the other area. And this was also like rapidly as like the sun was setting. So we have to do this before dark. So I have a brief video of me setting it down. It's not great quality, but you know, this is what we got. Hang on. Uh, no, stop, stop. Sorry, I'm trying to, here we go. Yeah, also the wind is buffeting us as we're trying. I'm gonna have my little charge and I'm trying to point him towards the mom. right the heck out of there um and cool. we backed off and um you know unfortunately we didn't get to see exactly what happened but i went back in the morning um and they were there's no no trace of them so um more than that we conclude that the mother let it off and that was a successful reunite yay great um Actually, I'm, um, we, let's open it up for questions, but I want to make sure we come back and, and have you give a pitch for the museum mm -hmm. and volunteer activities or whatever. But uh, um, do we have any questions for Megan? Uh, raise of hands or just um, speak yeah, there up? Is, there's a uh, hand raising feature if you know how to use that on Zoom. Otherwise, you can just unmute yourself yeah. and speak up. Yeah, and fun fact, my my partner who helped me do that, um, who work, works for a, a their tech company, um, kind of humble bragged about that at their next league meeting, and he got like a good like a good citizen award, like right. of, of like all the entire company for like saving the deer. Like, okay, you're welcome. No. <laughs> I, have, I have a question. Um, well, first, a little story. Um, I was sitting at my kitchen table having a cup of coffee and I, I was just out of the corner of my eye, I saw something run by through the window in the, in the street and it was a deer. And then about three seconds later, my dog ran by. And then about three seconds later, my wife ran by. <laughs> They're like, my wife was chasing the dog, was chasing the deer. But um, how can you, is there anything you can do to help uh, to keep deer away from rose, rose bushes? Uh, <laughs> the, the perennial question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, there's plenty of um, wildlife friendly uh, wildlife deterrents. Um, so I actually just the place I moved into um, has a bunch of rosemary planted around. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody realizes to it's really aromatic. It, it keeps the deer away. Like there's deer fences, um, and if you're trying to keep you know things like like bobcats away, you know can get um, floodlights. So motion activated things that will startle the animal, and make them leave. Um, or if you have, um, like if raccoons, what they do is they'll roll up um, your turf on the grass and eat the grubs underneath. Uh, just put cayenne pepper all around it. They don't like it, they'll leave it alone. Um, so yeah, there's tons of, um, yeah, on our website, I think we have a page specifically for um, okay. all, all, there's tons of different ways that you can do that. Good. But yeah, cool. there any question. Other questions? I'm not seeing other questions. Just go ahead and speak up. You, uh, I think you have the ability to unmute yourself, right, Tyler? People can yeah, unmute they, themselves. They can do that if good, they want. Good, good. Um, well, I see uh, something about coyotes, about um, potentially keeping them away. So um, if you are you know, in the La Miranda area um, and this coyote situation is on your mind, um, if you see one, whether or not it is, you know, this anomaly one we're hearing about. So if you have any children, um, you know, trying to put them on their 
shoulders to get them out of the area. Um, and what you can do is sort of the same way you'd treat a mountain lion. So you know, make yourself look bigger, uh, more intimidating. You can make noise um, and just generally try not to um, act like a, a prey animal. And again, you know, this is sort of an unusual circumstance. Almost always they're going to leave you alone, but even just the act of, you know, not running, but kind of standing your ground and letting them know that, you know, you're not going to be an easy meal is usually enough to let, because, you know, predators, they do not want to get injured. Because if you think about, you know, a wolf or a lion or something, if they can't hunt anymore, they're done and they're going to, you know, slowly starve over time. So if they think that you're enough of a threat, you're not worth it, they are going to leave you alone. Good point. Great. Well, thank you, Megan. Megan Andrews from the Wildlife, uh, the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. Um, quick comment about what, how people can get involved, or I'm sure you're taking uh, donations, and uh, uh, how can people help or, you know? Support yeah, you guys. Lindsay uh, would, would not be what it is without its involvement in the community and all of our you know, our volunteers that we work with and, you know, the members of the public that can help do their part with us. Um, and it's, it's sort of an evolving on a, a changing basis. So I would say just, you know, keep um, updated on our social media, what our needs might be, you know, like the current or the recent um, bird feeder issues. Um, if uh, we have, sometimes we'll get a call, like we had an animal last summer that we needed to change um, its sheets every day for a a quarantine thing and like we need a ton of bed sheets right now oh, wow. community okay. completely delivered and inundated us with bed sheets within the week cool. and that's wonderful but also you know right now we we have been managing to you know do pretty well um, considering you know the past year um and keeping our, our staff on board and not having to you know cut the essential functions we do every day uh, but, you know, we still, of course, we're running on emergency funds and we are not planning to open the exhibit hall anytime soon, you know, for the safety of our staff and the public. So we are doing, you know, remote programs that are like this. Um, you can get special VIP um, one-on-one -on -one programs like this for me. We're doing school programs to raise money. Um, so please, please, if you're a big fan of Lindsay, um, we definitely can use your support, it will make a difference. You can also check out, we have an online store now. Um, so you can also check out, I know I've been a fan of the gift shop since I was four. It's kind of where I got this rattlesnake plush yeah. here. So cool. yeah, just keep us in your in your minds and your hearts. Um, and if this is a tough time, but if you, if you have anything to spare, we um, will gladly accept your help. Well, it's an excellent website. It's an institution in our community. And I must say that it's one of the longest, uh, longest lived uh, services like this around. And so uh, we're very we're glad. In the country, we're the very oh. first wildlife hospital. There you go. Wow, that's amazing. Well, you've definitely launched a whole movement you know, through the nation. Um, thank you, Megan, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, round of applause and let's uh, turn it over to Tyler now for our sustainability tip of the month. All righty. Well, our tip of the month does not have to do with uh, wildlife, but hopefully it has to do with something we're all affirming is going to continue to happen between the end of February and through March. And that is some more rain. <laughs> We've enjoyed this week with sun, but we, we all know we need more rain. And so we always try to align our action of the month, uh, our tip of the month with the action that is being promoted by our youth team, Sustainable Leaders in Action, are the ones that came up with the cute little graphic down there in the lower right-hand corner. And uh, the month of, of March, which we're coming up to next week, it's Catch the Rain. It's the very simple idea of some kind of rainwater harvesting system. And you can get fancy and put uh, giant cisterns in and pumps and all kinds of things. But many of us would do the simple system of just hooking your downspouts up to barrels. And you can with a 1500 square foot roof, which isn't much, you can get up to 850 gallons of water if you get an inch of rain. Uh, so it can be a very effective way to collect some water in the rainy time and then use it again later. There's other things to explore too, to keep the water in your yard, like bioswales and other ways to uh, keep that rain from running off and enrich your soil 
We encourage everybody to visit graywateraction.org for all of their resources. They're an amazing uh, site for resources on this. But as always, the actions that we suggest for tip of the month are actions that you can take on the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge platform. So if you haven't already set up your Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge account, now is the time to do it. We actually have a fun uh, little competition going on right now. If you get a certain number of points for your team, you get prizes. So visit cleanercontracosta.org to learn about how to sign up for that, track your actions, track your progress, and catching the rain is one of the actions you can take on the challenge. As we know, water conservation is a climate action. Water conservation very much impacts our carbon footprint. So it's, it's all connected. So get out there and catch the rain. That's your tip. <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll get some soon. Great. Thank yeah. you, Tyler. And uh, Gotham is going to share with us now any upcoming events. Absolutely. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Gotham Satheson, and I am the producer for uh, this event. First things first, on March 3rd at 7 p.m., we have a free webinar. Learn how to prevent food waste at home and reduce your climate impact. Join this free special event with Chef Allison from Ends and Stems, who will share tips and demonstrate recipes to help you reduce food waste, save money, and make cooking easier. On March 22nd, our youth team, Sustainable Leaders in Action, are having a recruitment event. Are you or do you know a student who is interested in sustainability, climate change, or even in the environment? Do you wish you could have a bigger impact on the pressing issues the world faces today? Join Sustainable Contra Costa's youth leadership team, SLIIA, for a fun interactive event. Then on March 24th, we will be seeing you guys again for our next episode of Sustainability Live. We will get us thinking about spring gardening. Our next guests are gonna be from the Contra Costa Master Gardener Program, who's gonna share all the amazing resources that they have to offer. And we will also talk about what it takes to become a master gardener. For all of the information and for more, visit us at sustainablecoco.org. This has been Sustainability Tonight, a production of Sustainable Contra Costa. Our goals are for the show to provide you with useful and timely information about all aspects of living, sustainably guided by the 10 One Planet Living Principles, and to provide an online community for sharing information and learning together. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Central Sand, Contra Costa County Green Business Network, MCE, Eco Mulch, Republic Services, Contra Costa Water District, Recycle Smart, Tri Delta, Transit, Mount Diablo Resource Recovery, and the cities of Martinez, Walnut Creek, Moraga, Antioch, and Pittsburgh. The full list of our sponsors is on our website. Once again, sustainablecoco.org. Thank you to our Sustainability Live crew, our director and host, Mark Westwind, and our technical director, Tyler Snorton Phelps. For more information about One Planet Living and all of Sustainable Contra Costa's programs, activities, and events, please visit us at our website, sustainablecoco.org. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gotham. And we really appreciate your effort helping us put these shows together. Um, my thanks to Tyler, too, for all the technical support. And again, to Megan Andrews. Thank you, Megan, again. And to our audience, thank you for joining us. And uh, this is recorded. If you want to pass this on to other folks through uh, YouTube, uh, feel free. Uh, we'll see you next time. This has been Sustainability Live. Good night. Yeah.